Good morning. Glad to see all of you here. If you're a guest, if you would please do us a favor and reach out in front of you and take the connection card uh, that's there in the back of the pew, fill out that information for us and drop it in the offering plate. We'd really appreciate that. Um, lots of fun things going on. Had a great mission trip this past week. I'm sure we'll be sharing some information about that soon and then this coming week is children's camp so be praying for us as we go to davis oklahoma on tuesday and come back on friday lots of good things happening there and then uh take a week off and then we head to fuego in louisiana then we take a week off and vacation bible school so all of that for extra information to get you to bible school uh it is the week after the fourth of july so it starts on the ninth on Sunday, which is kind of new for us, this is the first time we've done it this way, and then we'll have Vacation Bible School Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Why do I tell you about all those dates? Because Vacation Bible School is important for you to be a part of. And so um, if you have not registered as a leader or a teacher or a helper, we would really appreciate your help during Vacation Bible School. Um, if you have not registered your children, Please go online and register them for that and encourage your neighbors to be a part of Vacation Bible School. This is a great theme this year. It's a, kind of a fun game theme like game boards and other games and uh, kids will really be excited about it. The music is wonderful as always. So this is a great opportunity for you to introduce new families to our church and to Christ. Um, so please be a part of Vacation Bible School. All right. It is now time to stand and go hug somebody. Say good morning. Good morning. If you would, take that book that's in front of you in the pew back there. That's called a hymnal, in case some of you have forgotten. Take that hymnal and turn to hymn number 132. There is power in the blood. We'll sing the first, second, and last of 132. Then we'll jump over to 136. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? So keep your finger there on 136, and we'll start on 132. There is power in the blood. burden of sin there's power in the blood power in the blood would you or evil a victory win there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood There's power in the blood, power in the blood. 
seated. Good news. Uh, I, I have a bid on my email for a new video system. <laughs> Bad news, it costs more than we have. But it'll be all right. The Lord will provide. We, we, you know, something's got to go wrong sometime, doesn't it? But I've been a Baptist so long, I don't need a hymn book. I don't know about you. you cut me, I bleed Broadman red. My favorite song is My Hope is Built on Nothing Less than Lottie Moon and Broadman Press. <laughs> I'm a Baptist to the core. So, uh, I wanted to give a quick report before we prayed. Uh, several of us were on mission trip last week. We had a wonderful time, impacted the community. We worked with the Well Church, the Well. Their pastor is Chris Millar. He may be with us here in a couple of weeks. They're going to be passing through on a Sunday. He may come and, and he'd like to come and thank you for all you did for their church. Uh, we did day camp <clears throat> where we had sports camp and a dance camp. We did basketball, soccer, and football camp. And then there was a, a dance studio that came out and did a dance camp. We had the highest attendance was 176 children on one day. And we had about 200 and something enrolled. They came different days, but had a great time. Some of those were saved and trusted Jesus. You'll get to meet them in heaven if nowhere else. And we, uh, did ministry at uh, some other uh, uh, churches around the area, doing some construction work. Is, are you going to come tell them about that? She... A heart to everyone that made a donation. Um, we had one whole trailer filled with donations. It was it was so great. Um, but one thing that uh, the Well Church did that um, a lot of our group group helped with was um, they did a treat bag and it was something something sweet something salty and a special treat and um, then they put a bottle of water in them and then there was a card from the Well Church and um, they would take them out to the community to um, um, I know they went to a hospital, and they, I think they went to the outlet mall, the outlet mall, and they went into the stores, and they would ask how many employees they had, and so however many employees they had, they would give them these bags, and they would say, you know, we're representing the Well Church, and we just want to thank you for serving our community, and they passed out 550 of those bags and through your gifts um, that go to our missions budget you paid for all of those but next year those will be on our donation wall we did not know that they we were going to get to be a part of that but um, that helps us tremendously so thank you thank you thank you for being a mission-minded church um, to just reach maybe even just one who knows um, but even one would be a blessing uh, for us to see them in heaven one day. So thank you. Amen. 
Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good gifts you give us so that we can in turn bless others. And we just want to be a conduit, Lord, through which your blessings flow as individuals and here as a church. And thank you that there's a percentage of what we receive every week that just turns around and goes out the door the next month to go do mission work here in Gracie County and in Whitesboro and Texas and around the United States, all over the world, Lord, and on special trips like this one to San Marcos, where we're able to bless others, and we just thank you and praise you for the, the opportunity we have to give freely uh, and let you just uh, use it for your glory. And so, Father, we praise and thank you, Lord, for all that you did and all that you've yet to do through your church. We do just join together praying for those who have losses in their families right now, we pray for those who are sick and ill. We pray especially for Jerry Warren right now and, and uh, for Dale Alsup and just lift those up to you, for Janie Henry, those who are hospitalized and facing some critical challenges. And we just ask you to be absolute Lord over all of that. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I told our group Thursday night we were getting ready for our departure on Friday morning, and I told them I didn't know if they had thought about this or not, but we had... A large group, there were 44 of us that ended up going. Some had to bail out at the last moment. 44 of us went, and uh, I told them Thursday night, I said, I don't know if it's crossed your mind, but this many people together for a whole week, not one person's had a stomach ache or a headache or any kind of issue at all. We didn't even have a low tire. We had 28 tires on the ground and not even one low tire. What do you think happened Friday morning? On the way home, we had one low tire, but it turned out just to be a valve stem, so it was a quick fix, and we were able to get that done and back on the road. But, you know, all the miles we drove and all the people we had, uh, God took care of us, and I credit that to him and for you guys back home praying for us, so thank you. I'm a mess today because yesterday I followed the desires of my foolish heart into the dark. Feeling far away, just need a couple of days to work real hard, hit the mark, and get myself back in good with you. But what a waste! What a losing game, cause that's what the blood is for, to clean this dirty man. fall one more time I soon forget that you're the light where I am free in perfect peace what if I can't get my act together Oh. 
morning. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so very thankful for your grace and your love for us, Lord. And we're just thankful for the our church as they prayed for us during our mission trip. We're so thankful that um, because of you, we reached out to the others and uh, showed the joy of being a Christian. And we know that we were fruitful in so many ways. And Lord, thank you for the fact that uh, everyone worked and prayed in harmony and that we uh, uh, came back safe and sound. Lord, we just ask that you be with those that are in the hospitals, those of who are grieving. We know that you are in control and we know that you're there with them. Lord, we just um, ask that you be with Brother Mike as he brings a sermon today. And Lord, that we may focus on the words that he brings us from your word. And then too, that we may get our minds and hearts right as we celebrate this Lord's Supper. Lord, again, thank you for all the blessings that you give us, for the blessings that you give our church, for the blessings that you give each of our families represented here. And Lord, finally, we just uh, come to the time where we give our tithes and offerings and we just pray that we use them as you want us to use them. Lord, forgive us when we fail you. Strengthen us, Lord, that we might be better. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.
Amen. Good to be here today. And uh, I told the early service after last week, I'm so tired I may be the first preacher to fall asleep in his own sermon. But let's hope not. And you've all heard about those long-winded preachers, haven't you? The funniest thing I ever heard, my father-in-law one day, our pastor had been out for two Sundays, and he came back, and he felt like he needed to make up for lost time, and he preached for a long time, and he preached for a long time, and he kept on preaching. And we got to lunch, and my father-in-law said, Man, the preacher was suffering from undelivered speech today. <laughs> Someone asked some, one of our guests a few weeks ago, I'd kind of gone a little bit long in the message, I guess, and they leaned up, and they... They asked a member that's sitting in front of them, said, how long has Brother Mike been preaching? And they said, I think 38 or 39 years. And they said, well, I think we'll just stay then. Surely he's about done. <laughs> just one more, please, just one more. The country church and, and uh, the, the pastor, uh, he, he kind of had a reputation. Now hang in there with me on this, but it was the, the parson's pro proclivity for proclaimed proclamation. In other words, he spoke a long time. And one day they had a guest in the sermon, and, and the preacher started preaching at about 11.30. And about 12, he kept going. About 12.30, he kept going. At 1 o'clock, he kept going. At one thirty he was still preaching. And this guest raised his hand. And he had never had anybody raise their hand during the service, and so he thought maybe he was a first-time visitor. He had a question about the sermon, so he stopped preaching and said, Sir, what can I do for you? And the man said, I just wondered if anybody knew if there was a barber shop open on Sunday afternoon in town. And he said, I cannot believe that you stopped my sermon to ask about a barber shop. You should have got your hair cut before you came to church. And the man said, well, honestly, preacher, I didn't need one when I came in here. <laughs> That's a long sermon. All that to say this, today's message is in Acts chapter 20 where Paul preaches a really long sermon. His sermon gets interrupted a little bit after midnight, and after the interruption, he comes back and preaches until dawn. He had so much to tell them because he was leaving the next morning that he preached into the night, and Luke records for us what happens has to do with the Lord's Supper because if you look at Acts chapter 20, verse 7, it tells us that they were assembled on the first day of the week to break bread. They were having this marathon message as a precursor to the Lord's Supper that night. And I want to read the passage before I do. I want to kind of set the stage so we'll all understand what's happening. We need to understand that back in this day and time, uh, their choices for light fixtures or for lighting in the church wasn't a choice between uh, incandescent light and LED lights. Their choice was between uh, virgin or extra virgin olive oil. They burned lamps. And our scripture tells us they had a lot of lamps burning at that time and so imagine you're there you're in a dimly lit room that's lit up by oil burning lamps it's a packed room and everybody wants to hear and, and because of the lamps and because of the amount of people a lot of the available oxygen has burned up it's getting stuffy and so you decide to go sit on the windowsill Paul keeps preaching and preaching you've had a long day you find yourself nodding off two or three times and most of you already know the rest of the story, but let's go ahead and read in Acts chapter 20. We'll begin in verse 7 and read through verse 12. Acts chapter 20, verse 7 through 12. <clears throat> On the first day of the week, we assembled to break bread. Paul spoke to them, and since he was about to depart the next day, he extended his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were assembled, and a young man named Eutychus was sitting on a windowsill and sank into a deep sleep as Paul kept on speaking. When he was overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was picked up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, embraced him, and said, Don't be alarmed, for his life is in him. And after going upstairs, breaking the bread and eating, Paul conversed a considerable time until dawn, then he left. They brought the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. Would you pray with me? Father, help us look at this example of what happened as the New Testament celebrated your supper this evening and how we might be encouraged as we apply some principles they learned that night to ourselves. 
We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Three things this passage gives us insight to, the Lord's Supper, it gives us a reminder, it gives us an opportunity, and it gives us an invitation. First of all, the reminder, the reminder is He is alive. Eutychus, what a name, huh? Everybody say that with me, Eutychus. All right. He falls asleep. Then he falls to his death from the third floor window. Talk about an abrupt ending to a sermon. But praise be to God, he's worshiping at Second Chance Baptist Church. You know, you've been out to West Texas driving on 287 towards Amarillo. You go through all those little small towns, and at the edge of every town, you'll see a Calvary Baptist Church or a New Beginnings Baptist Church. Some of them are called Second Baptist Church. And you know what happened, don't you? Somebody at First Baptist Church got upset, and they left and started their own church. Well, this guy wasn't at Second Baptist Church. He was at Second Chance Baptist Church. And I hope you know how important it is we get second chances. Amen? And he got a second chance for his life. And I would imagine all the sounds that they heard that night. First of all, there was a fall. Oh! Then there was a loud thud when he hit the ground. And there were gasps. Oh, what happened? Could it be? And there was a the sound of all those feet going down the three flights of stairs. And there was Paul, pushing his way through the crowd. And just like Elijah and Elisha in First and Second Kings, he laid down on top of the young man. And he said these words to them. Don't be alarmed. His life is in him. His life is in him. There must have been so many sounds at that point. The, the, the screams, the joy, the, the praises being lifted high on God, the singing, the dancing. And then they go back upstairs and eat. I told you they were Baptists. And they break bread. But this brings us to our reminder. What a wonderful, vivid, real object lesson for those gathered in the house that night. What a real lesson for us today. Imagine the joy around Jerusalem. They're running through the streets, screaming. His life is in him. He is alive. Not only was that a reference to this young man named Eutychus, it was a reference to Jesus as they celebrated the Lord's Supper. He is alive. If there had been TV back in that day, I'm sure at the corner of Market Street and Tabernacle Way, there would have been antennas and reporters everywhere. Hey, Mary, what happened? He's alive. Peter, what did you see? He's alive. John, what happened? He's alive. They all shouted the same message. History was changed with that short sentence. My life was changed with that short sentence. I hope your life has been changed because he's alive. If it has been, say it with me. He's alive. It's a reminder. But it's also an opportunity. We can be comfort. Look at the last verse. It says, they brought the boy home and were greatly comforted. I, I love to see these stories that sometimes we see reported in the news about servicemen and women who have been deployed for two or three deployments. They've been gone for their family. And the things they talk about that bring them so much comfort at home are the simple things in life. They talk about the, 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 their favorite recliner. They talk about just being able to sit across the table and look at their spouse while they're eating supper or to hear the children outside playing somebody holding their hand. And it's just those simple things that you cannot receive through a text message or a FaceTime video. And you think about these early disciples. They're like Jesus' family members. They thought they had lost Him. They had worshipped and followed Him as their Messiah. But when He was around, life was new and life was fresh and life was exciting because you never knew who might be healed or even resurrected from the dead. You never knew when he might come walking on the water or calming a storm. And then suddenly came the cross and Calvary and the borrowed tomb and the guard stationed outside. And their hopes were shattered, their dreams were lost. The comfort they felt when he was with them had now disappeared because remember the Holy Spirit had not come yet until the day of Pentecost they were alone and then comes that cry he's alive and there he is fixing their breakfast on the banks of the Sea of Galilee 
walking with them, talking with them, encouraging them. And the message for us today is this. No matter how far or how long you've been away, you can always come home and be comforted by Jesus. And this supper reminds us of the great links that God goes to to show and share His love with us. Today's a calling card from the Father that says, Come, allow me to love you. Come and allow me to comfort you. Here you find comfort and forgiveness, and most of all, you find grace. <laughs> and then lastly, it's an invitation. And the possibilities are endless. Maybe today you're at the starting line of your relationship with Christ. Maybe you're just now stepping on the track trying to feel your way into a relationship with Christ. Sometimes trying to find your way with God can be difficult. There's so much to learn and so many things I, I feel like I need to stop doing and so many things I feel like I need to start doing. Perhaps it even seems impossible that God could love me. If you feel that way, I have a story that I trust will encourage you. In 1847, a, name, a little boy named Homan Walsh went out to fly a kite. You see, he was taking part in a kite flying contest. Because of that, he brought his very best kite and he brought lots of string. And he stood on the Canadian bank of the Niagara River, letting out more and more of that string. And this kite kept going higher and further and higher and further until it stretched nearly a thousand feet of string out on his kite. A stranger on the American side of the Niagara River reached up and grabbed his string. And he won the prize that day, five dollars, which is a lot of money in 1847. But there was a lot more than five dollars at stake. You see, what they did is they took that string from his kite and they cut his kite loose. And onto that string they tied a cord and they pulled the cord back from the American side to the Canadian side. And when the cord got to the Canadian side, they tied a piece of rope onto that cord and they pulled the rope back with the cord to the American side. And when it got to the American side, they took that rope and they tied a cable onto that rope and they pulled the cable back over to the Canadian side. When the cable got there, they tied a bigger cable on there, and they pulled it back over to the American side. And for the first time in history, people from Canada and America were connected by a cable. They paid 25 cents a piece to go across that cable in a bucket. Before long, they built 50-foot towers on both sides of the Niagara River. Because of that one little kite string, they were able to stretch huge suspension cables. They built a bridge across the Niagara River, the first of 15 to be built. Six of those are still in service today. People began to ride their horses and buggies across the river, walking across the river. And now they go across multi-lane concrete bridges, some so often but they fail to recognize the beauty of the scenery. And more than likely, it doesn't occur to anybody who drives on those bridges today that somewhere in the past, just to get to this modern-day miracle we call a bridge, a little boy had to fly a kite. You know, if great bridges can get their start with a little boy's string and kite, I'll tell you this, great spiritual lives can begin with just one simple decision. And the Lord's Supper before us, it's one of the simplest meals in the world. And from the vantage point of many, it might not seem more like a boy flying his kite. But our offer to you today is this. It's more than just a string of connection between you and God. I offer to you this is that if you'll make that connection from the smallest beginnings, just a string between you and God, you can build a great bridge of faith. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the encouragement we received from this passage when 
Paul's in Troas and preaching. Thank you, you're the God of second chances. Thank you, you're the God who is waiting for us to grab a hold of that string to build a bridge of faith for you. So, Father, I pray today if there be one single person, a man or woman or a boy or girl, who's never trusted you today as their Savior, they would just take that small step of faith, just a string between them and you, and begin to build that bridge of faith and endurance and hope that will span all eternity. As we come to celebrate with you at your invitation this supper, Lord, help us remember these elements are important not because we chose them to remind us of you, but because you chose them and told us as often as we do this to remember you. So we thank you and praise you, Lord, for this opportunity. In Jesus' name. As our deacons are coming forward to make preparations, I want to encourage you just to take this time to prepare your own heart. Ask the Lord to examine your heart. Confess any sin that you may need to confess and make yourself right with the Lord.
Bibles teach us that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, taught them, this is my body which is for you, do this as often as you do.
Supper, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance. Lord, as we um, receive from you this morning this wafer of unleavened bread, we felt it broken in our mouth. We are reminded of your body broken for us. As we taste the bitterness of the cup, we're reminded, Lord, of your blood shed. Reminded what the author of Hebrews said to us, that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. And we thank you that your blood is the covering, the atoning sacrifice that covers our sin. And most importantly, Lord, we thank you that it was your love for the world, for each one of us that held you to the cross that awful time when they tortured you, especially when the Father placed upon you the sin of the entire world and turned away from you for a period of time. You endured the cross, scorning and shame. Now we're told you were seated at the right hand of the Father who is in heaven, and rightfully so, and we praise you, Lord Jesus, and thank you for giving us this simple meal to remind us how much you love us. Now that you'd be with us as we have this invitation, Lord, it's your invitation to men and women and boys and girls. Lord, I pray if there be just one person here today who has never given their life to you, never invited you to forgive their sin and transform their life, that Lord Jesus, today would be the day they do that. Pray for other decisions that need to be made today. Church membership, a rededication, or follow through on a commitment to be baptized that never was followed up on. Whatever you're speaking, Lord, into the lives of those here, help us respond in obedience and faith. And the joy that comes from obedience to you is indescribable. So help us, Lord, as we respond now. We pray it in Jesus. Thank you, Deacons. If you would stand, if you have a decision to make today or like someone to pray with you, I'd love to receive you. Would you come?
stand here by me. This is Mark Lindy, and uh, y'all have a seat if you would. And uh, Mark and his wife Polly began coming to our church, probably uh, began a year and a half ago, about July last year, so almost a year ago, and April and I had the privilege to go visit them in their home. And they have, they, they get the award for producing the most food on a residential lot. They have a garden like you would not believe, so... If you're hungry, go see them. They will feed you, I promise you. But Mark has trusted Jesus Christ as a Savior, and he wanted to come stand up for Jesus this morning, let him let you know that he believes in him, and he wants to follow through with baptism. And so if you rejoice with him, say amen. amen. All right. And then we also have Buddy Lindsay. Buddy, you come and stand by me. Buddy uh, has been coming here for a while as well. Buddy serves with our Southern Baptists of Texas Disaster Relief. He's one of our chaplains, and he's got to deploy and go do some ministry and he wants to be a part of our church family. He's a believer, been baptized, transferring his letter from First Baptist in Gordonville. So if you receive Buddy, say amen. amen. And all right. And wonderful. Praise the Lord for today. Let's all stand and join hands across the aisle. After we pray, I'd encourage you to come down here and welcome these two men to our fellowship and uh, welcome them in. So uh, Tommy Heron, would you pray for us this morning? Okay. 